So today we are continue our 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 series, CS seminar series, and we have Johan Bolin. Johan is professor of informatics at Indiana University. He was formerly staff scientist at Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. He is, is for informatics, but his PhD was in, in experimental psychology. So he has very interesting background and this reflects on his ideas and his papers. It's, if you did, never read any of those, you should because he has very important people, uh, very important articles in fact in these fields. He usually work on computational social science, social complexity, health, well-being, machine learning, and many others. It be, has been funded by DARPA, NSF, all major granting uh, agencies from the US, especially from the US. And Johan uh, lives in Bloomington right now. He's stuck in a pile of over 30 centimeters of uh, snow. There is a huge uh, winter storm going on right now. Hopefully he, he will be able to keep his power on to the end of this seminar at least. And he lives with his wife and daughter. And when he's not Johan, he's DJ Arnes. So he, he shakes Bloomington lights with DJ, with he, he partners on crime, Dr. Rocha, also known as E Trash. But I'll stop here. Today he'll talk, talk about uh, psychology, not DJ, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it depends on what you, I mean, I've got my decks right here, so just okay, let me know. We finish with some mix. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, the floor is yours. Cool, okay, so I should share my screen now, right? Yeah. Okay, let me do that. I'm just gonna share the whole thing. Well, perhaps I should only share the um, uh, keynote, right? Let's let's see what this works. Yeah. I usually don't do this. No, no, I'm gonna share the desktop. Okay, share. That gives me a little bit of flexibility. Okay, can you guys see my my slides? Yeah. 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 Perfect. And I'll minimize the. No, there we, you go. we can only see we can only see the the the, the full presentation. So you're good to go. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, okay. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, as you, as you heard, I was just talking to, to Diogo about this and, you know, I, I, I realized I'm, I'm speaking to a department of computer science, you know, and so, but rather this presentation will be about things that many computer scientists can consider perhaps frivolous or not really rel relevant to uh, computer science. But I come from the School of Informatics, which is a very inter interdisciplinary environment, also a lot of ties with cognitive science, psychology and brain sciences, etc. And the idea is to use computers and computers, uh, compu uh, computer algorithms to better understand important things about human cognition and behavior. Um, which, because of my background in experimental psychology, and yes, rats and mazes, that kind of stuff, uh, but I specialized in robotics and machine learning uh, very early on. I, I actually, in, you know, was really smitten by this notion of neural networks in the late '80s, and I'm happy to see that those ideas, those ideas, have made a comeback. Anyway, so but today I'll be talking a little bit about sort of my research on what we call internalizing disorders. Um, this is very um, inter interdisciplinary work, so I should certainly acknowledge my collaborators. I won't uh, spend too much time, but we have a uh, extensive uh, uh, center. My lab is actually a, a part of the Center for Social and Biomedical Complexity. I'm a director of the center and the lab, uh, along with uh, Louis Rocha, the uh, uh, my co-director of the center. So here's the two of us. Uh, these are postdocs. Uh, uh, th these are the faculty members that I collaborate with very closely on this research in the School of um, uh, Psychology and Brain Sciences. Um, i got a, a bunch of uh, graduate students uh, that are working their PhDs with me right now. It's quite an extensive group. And uh, I should also say that I'm pretty closely affiliated with the uh, University of Wageningen in uh, Holland, as well as the um, um, uh, as well as the University of Amsterdam, where right now I'm a fellow at the Institute for Urban Mental Health uh, that is led by uh, Claudie Bokting. Uh, so as you can see, it's a very uh, interdisciplinary group. Uh, this is also why our funding sort of spans the gamut of, you know, DARPA, uh, uh, the National Science Foundation, as well as the NIH. 
Um, in this talk, again, even though a lot of my work is on complex networks and their applications in, for example, modeling uh, citation graphs, scholarly communication, etc. Um, today, I'll be talking about using sort of uh, advances in machine learning and natural language processing to model human well-being and mental health. I'll do it in three parts. Uh, the first part, I'll, I'll give you sort of a, a sampler of the kind of methods that we use to study how human emotions, how we can study how human emotions evolve at the minute scale if necessary, uh, which was recently published in uh, Nature Human Behavior. And then I'll talk a little bit about modeling the dynamics of mood disorders like depression, anxiety, etc., which are in essence uh, so could be construed as, as sort of um, psychopathologies that uh, uh, originate from the, uh, the inability uh, to regulate uh, emotions and behavior. And then third, I'll talk a little about sort of behavioral and cognitive indicators of, of, of mental health in, this, in particular in the context of um, uh, internalizing disorder. So uh, that's a lot of preliminaries. So the first part I wanted to talk about is sort of how people self-regulate their emotions. Self-regulation of emotions is, even though it sounds like a, a rather frivolous thing, something that, you know, romantic writers write about, emotions are absolutely crucial uh, to our cognition and, and, and behavior. You know, the uh, down to the, almost to the cellular level, we're hardwired for emotions and they, they, they are a very important component of, of the sort of the, the complex dynamics that shape our cognition and behavior. Maintaining emotional homeostasis is very important, and most people have acquired sort of self-regulation strategies that they uh, that they can employ to maintain that homeostasis. For example, there's behavioral strategies. You know, if someone's really uh, ticking you off, it's good to walk out of the bar, right, and cool down a little bit. So there's, it's a very basic physical strategy to maintain emotion uh, emotional homeostasis. Reappraisal, more of a cognitive approach, is that people re-examine a situation to arrive at a desirable evaluation. So this is sort of the, the idea of looking at the glass and convincing yourself it's it's half full instead of half empty. It's just you re-examine the situation to, to uh, you know, to perhaps arrive at a more desirable uh, evaluation. It's also distraction, works great with toddlers. Redirect one's attention to other matters. Sure, your friends may be not as nice as you want them to be, but then, you know, at least your family is, is nice to you and you can feel good about that. The, our research in particular has looked at affect labeling, which is an, a very sort of behaviorist strategy, if you, if you think about it, of putting one's feelings into words and self-regulating your emotions uh, 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 um, uh, using uh, what is essentially sort of a, 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 a linguistic, a lexical strategy. Um, Lieberman in 2011 actually published a fantastic paper uh, where they uh, survey sort of the research on affect labeling and its effectiveness. And it's, it's a surprisingly effective yet, okay, I can't see my mouse, okay. Um, an, an amazingly effective and simple strategy to self-regulate emotions. The, the advantages are numerous. One of them is that it's really simple. The only thing you have to do is just put your feelings into words, not too many words. You shouldn't dwell on it, but just putting your feelings into words, just saying, I feel bad, I feel good, you know, uh, depending on how you want to regulate. It's been shown to be very effective, rapidly lessen negative emotions in the context of anxiety, fear towards phobias. Um, and the interesting thing is it's effect, it's implicit. It's effective even when people don't believe it works. So essentially you just simply have to convince people to put their feelings into words. And when they do, even if they believe it's bogus, it will still help to regulate their emotions. Uh, in fact, there's a, a, a Lieberman again in 2007 published on, uh, I see there's a, there's a chat. Um, I can't pull it up, but okay. Uh, I'm gonna have to sort of guess where my mouse is at. Um, okay. Okay, good. So um, I'm just going back here. Yeah. So the the idea with um, affect labeling is isn't just that it's it, it, sort of people. It, it's not just empirically established that it works, but there's actually good reasons um, from brain science to believe that it disrupts the activity of the amygdala uh, and uh, to, uh, in, in, in particularly in response to uh, effective stimuli. And so there's, there's, there's some pathways in the brain that, uh, that may explain quite well why effective, uh, affect labeling is so effective 
in, uh, in down-regulating or self-regulating emotions, namely that, that when you put your um, uh, uh, feelings into words, you activate parts of the brain involved with language and behavior that can actually disrupt amygdala activity to effective stimuli and therefore sort of disrupt the feedback loop that would otherwise lead to um, uh, sort of an uh, increased emotional an increased emotional state. The problem with affect labeling, though, and this is sort of a typical conundrum in, empiri uh, in, in empirical science, but in, in particular in cognitive science, is that it's just really difficult to measure effect. You know, if, if, if to, to determine how people feel, of course, there's biophysical measurements, but they're they're sort of epiphenomena to a degree. To measure emotions, you have to ask people how they feel. To a large degree, right? And of course, the to study the effect, the 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 effect or the effectiveness of affect labeling. A so a simplified me methodology would be to measure someone's affect, how they feel, then expose them to a sort of an evocative stimulus that evokes emo emotions. Ask one group to perform affect labeling to label their emotions and then to measure their affect again but of course this leads to difficulties with repeated within subject measurements of the effect which very often involves simply asking people how they feel but if you ask them how they feel and they tell you how they feel they're essentially performing affect labeling so methodologically speaking this is a real conundrum introspective self-reports um, are problematic for a number of reasons as well. You know, you've got a, a strong experimenter bias, you're putting people in the lab, you're, you're having someone in a lab code, ask them how they feel, you've got social conformity bias in the sense that people are not prone to uh, express negative emotions. Uh, it's really difficult to norm uh, because of course, you know, when someone rates their emotions, they do so relative to their own personal context. So essentially you end up with individual introspective assessments of state, but that, you cannot norm against a personal baseline. Um, of course, they're difficult to repeat because the more often they repeat them, the greater the odds of having uh, experimenter bias. And uh, bringing people into the lab can be difficult um, and costly. And you might end up with a sample that is uh, weird, you know, as they call it, you know, W-E-I-R-D, namely predominantly white because you're talking about graduate students, uh, predominantly uh, educated, and your sample might not be as representative of the general population as you want. Now, physical measurements, uh, you know, are common in the sense that you you, you can measure the um, activation of the musculature of the face, you can look at sort of uh, skin conductance, etc., to gauge the emotional state of the individual. But uh, then the question, of course, is how, how well those physical responses match subjective states. And again, you're you're essentially putting people in a lab and uh, 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 and putting. Uh, measurement instruments on their body, which may lead to interaction effects. So it's just really difficult to measure naturally occurring emotions, not, not a, provoked emotions at high temporal resolution. So our approach is to use a wealth of data that is presently available uh, to researchers on emotions, namely social media data. About 70% of the world's population and, and of, the, uh, of, of the US population as well, Perhaps it's the US population, not the world's population. Perhaps I spoke too quickly, but 70% of the US population at least is active on social media. And so what people generally do in social media is that they post reports about their personal status, including how they feel. And so our approach has been to take those online self-reports and then to perform sentiment analysis, which is a natural language processing technique to, to translate text into an emotional uh, rating uh, uh, surrounding that online self-report to gauge the degree to which that expression of an emotion has affected the underlying affective state of the individual. Um, now, the of course, the questions involved in this is, well, I mean, if you're measuring emotions from language, do emotions really bias language? Because people could be saying things on, on people, you know, put up a front, for example, on social media. It's not a given that the text that they post on social media is truly reflective of their emotional state. So the question, of course, is do emotions really bias language? We don't know, but we might find out. Um, does sentiment analysis actually reveal individual emotions? For example, let's just say I'm having a meal in a restaurant and I'm complaining that the meal isn't very good. You know, on Instagram or on, 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 on Twitter, I'm complaining, for example, that the, the steak is overdone or my tofu is, not, is insufficiently crispy or something like that. Does that actually, that would be a negative tweet and a sentiment analysis uh, tool would 
correctly gauge that tweet as being uh, 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 as having negative sentiment. That does not necessarily mean that I'm being particularly unhappy about my, a, a person at a personal level. I might be unhappy about the tofu, but it doesn't mean that I'm experiencing negative emotions necessarily. So the other question is, let's just say an emotion, a reported emotion did actually occur. When, well, relative to the self-report, when did it actually occur, right? So it's possible that we had an emotion 10 minutes ago and I just got around to posting it on, on social media, for example, right? So the, the approach that we took here is, is basically, we looked for, for hundreds of thousands of individuals, for instances where they very explicitly and literally said, I feel followed by a positive or a negative uh, adjective or adverb uh, because people mix them up. Um, we had a limited set of uh, adjectives and adverbs that we used here. Again, we're going for high precision and low recall, right? So I feel good, bad, happy, unhappy, et cetera, but no other uh, adjectives. We only had about uh, uh, four, four positive ones and six negative ones that we looked at. So when people actually posted that tweet, we considered that T0. That was the point in time at which we presume that the emo that an emotion occurred because the individual reported actually feeling that, uh, that emotion, right? So then we looked at all of the tweets surrounding that, 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 time, that point in time, T0, and we grouped them according to the time that those tweets were posted before or after that point T0, right? So we could bend these tweets at one minute, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, et cetera, one minute after, two minutes after, uh, that the point in time at which the individual reported feeling and emotion. And then, of course, as we, as we bend the tweets and we perform a sentiment analysis on those tweets, the, we end up with a, a, a distribution of sentiment values for that bin that essentially tells us sort of that can tell us what the expected emotional level of individuals is before and after they report explicitly report the experience of having an emotion now of course there will be the, these measurements will be noisy there's lots of other drivers that that, that drive the uh, sentiment of language how people feel at a particular point in time how they express those feelings etc so of course there will be there will be variation um, and noise on our measurements now um, we looked at a sample of 710,000 randomly chosen Twitter users. <clears throat> it's a relatively older harvest, but we're, uh, you know, we're making the assumption here that uh, oh. human beings haven't changed dramatically okay. over the past eight years. I'm sorry, someone asking a question? Yeah, yeah, no, I I'm just interrupting you just a bit real quick. Can we do, can we do uh, questions during or you prefer in the end? I mean, I, I don't mind either way. I prefer like a more interactive environment. So if someone wants to jump in, the the, the more than okay. free to do that. Okay, so let's do it like this. If you have a question, you can put on chat or you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I should have I should have mentioned that. Yeah, I don't mind questions at all. I think it's better to just jump in and and, and, and you know if if, if 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 something isn't clear to fix it right right there on the spot. Okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, so we had. Um, oh, so there's already a chat. I mean, the only okay. Oh, you can't unmute. Ronaldo saying they can't unmute. And that he has a question. Ronaldo, if you type the question, I will. Now you can. Now you can. I, I changed the permission. Oh, okay. So, uh, you Johan, just a, a quick my... clarification here. I'm just curious about this, um, the sentiment analysis on tweets, right? And how how sensitive this is. Because I'm always curious about this because it's so so short text, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, are you taking a collect? individual tweets or are you somehow mm -hmm. aggregating a collection of tweets I have for a period of time, let's say a day or, um, and how yeah, sensitive it is for you to actually get some variations in actually, um, anyway, so that's the, the just a qualification. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. I was just about to get to that. In fact, um, sentiment analysis. I mean, first of all, yeah, this is done at the level of individual tweets. We have to, because every individual tweet was posted at a particular point in time relative to when that individual, so this is a within subjects measurement, right? Um, in essence, because we're looking at when that individual tweet was posted relative to when the individual reported having a, an emotion. The sentiment analysis tool that we use is called Vader. Um, it's uh, by um, Ribeiro et al actually in 2016 posted a, uh, a set of benchmarks for a variety of uh, sentiment analysis tools where Vader actually performed best specifically for a set of tweets, um, a very large set of tweets. 
uh, against ground truth, uh, and this is essentially uh, uh, people reading those tweets and rating them. And if you look at the the uh, the the the, uh, the positive F one, negative F one, and the macro F one reported in that benchmark, you can see that Vader <clears throat> did very very well. The reason for that being is that's a it's a very transparent sentiment analysis tool. It's got an extensive lexicon of words that have been human rated, and <clears throat> it has a an extensive uh, grammar and punctuation engine as well, in the sense that it recognizes um, negation, even hedging, uh, multiplication, like I am so unhappy about this. It even counts the number of O's in the so, it, it counts the number of exclamation uh, uh, points, etc. So it's a, it's a relatively accurate, relative to the standard of people reading a tweet and uh, and making a judgment about whether that tweet is, is positive or negative. So. Yeah, it's the best that we can do for individual tweets, but we rated individual tweets and we used one of the best and most accurate sent, sent analysis tools around. Thank you. Does, does that answer your question, Ronaldo? Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, but nothing's perfect, I agree. I mean, there will be, you know, I mean, it's. It, 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 I will say this, that people are not very good at reading text and deriving some, does, does this tool capture irony? Yeah, everybody asks that, probably not, no. I mean, the essence of irony is that you say something different for rhetorical reasons than what you really mean or the opposite. And for that, you need more uh, accurate modeling of what people believe. We're actually working on a project that is trying to do that, but this sentiment uh, analysis tool does not capture irony. I will say this again, we're looking at um, 710,000 randomly chosen Twitter users, which, to a varying degree might actually employ irony in their uh, online communication, but I, it's difficult to believe that everyone uses irony or, ex or expresses the opposite mood of what they, their opposite sentiment from what they're really experiencing. Now, okay, so I'll get back to this. I'll get back to this because if, if this is true, so let's just say our sentiment analysis is bogus and the tool doesn't capture irony and everybody uses irony or lies about their true feelings, then we shouldn't have found the the effect that we did find, okay? So that's a pretty, anyway, so the, the affect labeling sample, to be clear here, we looked at, at tweets that said, literally, I feel, I'm feeling, or I'm feeling, and then good, happy, great, awesome, <clears throat> or negative, bad, unhappy, sad, terrible, horrible, and awful, and only those uh, expressions. So it's a limited set of high precision but uh, 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 sentences or expressions that we were looking for. So whenever an individual out of those 710,000 individuals anywhere in their timeline expressed that tweet, we took that tweet and then um, uh, examined all tweets before and after that statement uh, um, down to uh, um, no, six hours before and six hours after in one minute bins. Now, about 100 and 10,000 individuals made such statements. You could see that uh, making negative state, figurative la uh, language or quotations, knock yourself out as it was deemed to be promoting violence. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yes, no, no, it doesn't. It, I mean, it's it, it, your, your results will vary. Your results will vary. Although the lexicon to, nar to a large degree will reflect that knock will have those or knock out will have those different meanings in the language. And so therefore it will not probably not be rated as, as exclusively negative, but this is the result of social media or Twitter using very basic um, lexicon matching techniques to determine whether a tweet is promoting violence or not, a practice that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm pretty much opposed to. So um, if you, wouldn't you get a lot of people who never said anything? Some people aren't active, yeah. So yeah, people aren't very active. Uh, they, yeah, in, in essence, there's a self-selection process, uh, uh, bias happening here because people are very active, of course, would have a higher probability of being um, included uh, in this pool. That That is true. Yeah, some people have a lot more tweets than others. And, but we did take that account because we normalize our data relative to activity levels in general. Um, yeah, okay. So. That being what it is, we ended up with about 110,000 individuals, meaning that they made about 42,000, 67,000 positive and negative statements, as I outlined just now. Now, we do clean up this data. Uh, we removed individuals that were more active than the 95th percentile of, of all users. We removed retweets. 
We also removed tweets that were posted on unusual days where activity levels were either below the fifth percentile or above the 95th percentile across all days of the period that we looked at. Um, we removed affect labeling tweets without an adjective. So when someone says, I am, or I feel, we did not include that. We removed users without time zone information so that we had some check on when people were posting this. We also removed cases where people performed, uh, uh, posted an affect labeling tweet, as I outlined, within the same 48 hours. So we weren't, um, uh, so we weren't taking into account individuals that were overactive in, in the sense that they weren't overactive labelers, uh, et cetera. But I mean, you do the best that you can with the data that you have. Otherwise, again, you'd have to put people in the lab and you'd suffer from all of those uh, restrictions as well. Now, here's the time series. You can see there's a lot of noise here. Uh, the time series for the positive affect labeling is on the left-hand side. The, uh, the negative affect labeling is on the right-hand side. And what you can see is that even though there's a lot of noise in these time series, that if you look at a 95% confidence interval across the entire time series, we do have a significant elevation of positive sentiment in the tweets that precede the uh, uh, that precede the positive affect labeling, and a significant decline well beyond that 95% confidence interval for people who perform a, uh, a negative affect labeling. So when people say, I am feeling bad, you can see that the sentiment of tweets starts to deteriorate hours before. Now we use the QSUM, which is a cumulative uh, uh, sum method to actually find the, the change points in the time series. And we find two, in both cases, we found two significant change points where the time series exceeded sort of a, 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 run, a, a cumulative uh, 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 some of the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the um, uh, 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 variants. Those are the gray vertical bars, which essentially we could use as a, sort of a marker of the period in which we do find elevated or uh, um, or uh, declining uh, sentiment. And as you can see, <clears throat> the period in which we see that tweets exhibit elevated sentiment is about an hour and a half surrounding the uh, uh, positive affect labeling uh, tweet. And for the negative. Affect labeling tweet, we see about an hour that the tweets are significantly more negative an hour before the negative affect labeling. But then very quickly within 10 minutes, we cover to sort of the previous baseline. And that's interesting because what it means is that we can observe a number of things from these time series. First of all, we see that before the affect labeling takes place, we have a change in the, uh, the underlying sentiment, the underlying emotions. As soon as the affect labeling takes place, both positive and negative, we have sort of a return to the previous baseline, which in the case of the positive emotion is rather slow, but in the case of the negative emotion, it's very, very fast. Within 10 minutes, we see an immediate return, which suggests or indicates that when people do negative affect labeling, which means that they, they say, I feel bad, um, their sentiment returns to previous baseline levels very quickly uh, uh, afterwards. In fact, um, I wanna stress again, that the emotional expression itself at time zero was excluded. So, uh, so we're, we're not, this is not an artifact of us including the affect labeling tweet that of course cont contains a positive and negative uh, adverb in our analysis itself. So these are tweets that have nothing to do with the affect labeling tweet other than the fact that we're posted uh, in, in their proximity uh, time-wise. Um, Again, we did not analyze any timelines that had more than one explicit emotional expression within a 48 hour time span. And this is about six hours before and six hours after. Um, again, uh, these are efforts to control to the greatest degree possible sort of confounding of what we observe. Uh, we did try to fit sort of the, um, the um, sort of increases and declines of sentiment for the positive and negative uh, emotions. Um, for, for those time series, what we found is that uh, exponential functions, but um, separate exponential functions for both the ramp up and the ramp down, uh, ramp down of these emotions provided the best fit. Um, the fact that these exponential functions provided the best fit might be indicative of sort of an accelerating process, a sort of a feedback process in which positive as well as negative sentiment starts to accelerate and is then punctuated by the point in time at which people express the emotion after which we see a sort of a decay of the emotion back to the previous um, 
uh, baseline, which is very interesting. Again, I want to stress that if our measurements are bogus and everybody's lying on Twitter and we're not detecting sarcasm and we're not uh, detecting um, and we're not detecting uh, um, irony, etc., we would not have found this. Right? This these these measurements are only possible because someone said they felt bad and then the, or they had a positive or a negative emotion explicitly. And the sentiment values of the tweets before and after they, they report having this emotion change significantly. Um, if again, if our measurements is a measurement of sentiment is wrong and it's and it, we would we, we'd essentially find no changes relative to, to the baseline. Um, we also had a very strict, we, we tested these results against a very strict null model as well, where essentially we randomly sampled tweets from. From, uh, from every one minute window, uh, making sure that for every one minute window where we, where we randomly scrambled these tweets, uh, we made sure that the tweets within every window had the same week day distribution of the original empirical window, meaning that if, if for example, five minutes before the affect labeling, we had lots of Monday tweets, then our null model would also have lots of randomly selected uh, uh, Monday tweets, right? And as you can see again, from the 95% confidence intervals for the null model, as well as the uh, observed 95% uh, confidence interval, you could see that there's significant changes in sentiment that precede and follow people self-reporting that they are actually experiencing an emotion. That's really telling because what it, what it means is that, that we can, we learn that sentiment analysis does actually measure or is likely to measure an underlying emotion that takes place, right? That it's not just sort of random fluctuations in sentiment that we're measuring uh, where the noise levels because of irony and sarcasm and people lying on Twitter are so high that it's just a, a, a sort of a, a, a random walk over time. Uh, it also means that because the peak of those emotions coincides exactly with the affect labeling after which we see a decay of both, both the positive and the negative emotion back to the baseline, that affect labeling seems to actually downregulate these emotions very quickly. For the positive valence, that's the good news. It does downregulate the positive valence, uh, the positive emotion, but not to the degree that the negative valence gets, gets downregulated. And so from these results, and this, this actually confirms what people have been finding in the lab, um, it's actually quite useful when you're having a negative emotion to tell someone in a few words how you're feeling. Not too many words, because then you might you run the risk of actually uh, um, uh, reinforcing that feedback loop. Um, we did actually separate the results for um, uh, male and uh, uh, female subjects using a the M3 classifier, which actually takes the Twitter profile of the individual as well as their tweets and uh, uh, estimates whether they are either male or female. We don't see much difference. Of course, the noise level is higher because the samples are smaller. But I think if you eyeball this to a degree, you can see that, uh, that for the uh, female group, we might be observing a sharper and faster return to a baseline after uh, the negative affect labeling case. Uh, from which you might conclude that at least for that subsample, uh, uh, negative affect labeling could be more uh, productive. Uh, but all in all, you know, there's no reason to believe that um, uh, women and men uh, have different emotional uh, dynamics and that they, they, they would respond differently to affect labeling as uh, an intervention from this data. But there's, there's a slight indication that at least in the case of uh, uh, female Twitter users, we see uh, uh, a more significant drop of negative sentiment, but also a faster reversal, a more significant reversal to the, to the baseline after the negative affect labeling. So in conclusion, what I can recommend from, from these results, what accuracy do you get from the gender classifier? I think it's, I, I, I have to be careful. I, I don't remember out of the top of my head, but it's pretty high. I don't about like, like 85%, sort of in the, it's in the 80s. It's pretty good. Age, not so good, but for gender, it's actually quite good. Thank you, James. I can look it up. It's the M3 classifier. It does really well. It's because it triangulates from a variety. It, it, it looks at the profile photo, looks at the name, looks at the tweets. And so it really triangulates from a, from a variety of uh, uh, information sources. But uh, M3, yes. M as in man. Yeah. 
Um, so in conclusions, putting your feelings into words, but not too many, can be good for you. And you can even do it on social media. So if social media leads to any good, uh, I, I recommend that you use it for affect labeling. So if you're feeling bad, just tell someone, I am feeling bad or I'm feeling nervous. And yes, I think that's the one. Yes. I can't open the website now to, yes, M3 inference, that's the one. Yeah, it's open source, very easy to use, very productive. And I think for computational social science, especially when we rely on social media data, social scientists want to have representative samples, or at least have some assurance that, you know, that we know what our sample consists of. And since these are self-selected sample, the M3 classifier has been a, a crucial tool, tool for us. Um, anyway, so the other good news is that naturally occurring feelings may last only about one and a half hours. So if you're not feeling great, you can just also decide to just sit it out. Uh, because one and a half hours isn't that bad. And uh, the, the main thing is not, not to make things worse. Um, the, the often overlooked implication here in this research is that while well, psychologically affect labeling is interesting, but um, the, this result I think is very validating with respect to the use of sentiment analysis on social media data to gauge human emotions. Because our results, think about this, if sentiment analysis did, is just text failings, we wouldn't have found the results that we, uh, that we did find, right? It must capture traces of an actual human emotion that takes, that takes place, otherwise we would not have seen the changes that we did. We would have had a flat sort of random walk style time series of sentiment, regardless of people reporting that they were actually experiencing an emotion, but we didn't. The, the actual details in the paper below. Uh, I told you that I was going to talk. I, I was going. I was going to talk about uh, yes. There's a question. I think someone raised their hand. Hey, hi, hi Bowen. Um, quick question. Uh, sure. Do you think it would also be important to account for the content of the tweets people were receiving or seeing in their in their timelines because uh, I remember a Facebook uh, um, article in which they measure how susceptible people were to the influence of the sentiment of the messages they were reading yeah. and that people who are like exposed to more negative messages, they were likely to post yeah. more negative things. Do you think it could have this social component as well? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And so you remember the, I, I mentioned that the best fits we obtained for these sort of exponential functions, which might suggest some kind of an acceleration of sentiment. And it could be that there, it, it could be that what we're observing is sort of a social reinforcement of that sentiment where someone said, oh, um, you know, where someone starts to post negative tweets and then people respond with more negative tweets in response to those negative tweets. And you have sort of a runaway negative sentiment. That's, it's, yeah, that's possible, and that's definitely one of the things we're looking at. And in fact, I'm not discussing it here, but we looked at what is called a happiness paradox online. And the happiness paradox is such that, the, that most individuals on social media or in social networks in general will experience a situation where their sentiment is, their average mood is more negative than the average mood of all of their friends. So on social media, very strong mood homophily. People generally hang out with people that have sort of similar baseline levels of sentiment to them. But in addition to that, because of how these social networks work and because popularity is correlated with positive affect, what you see is that most individuals on social media will be surrounded by a group of friends that on average are happier than they are. And so it's not too difficult to imagine, I'll, I'll post a reference to that paper later on, but it's not too difficult to imagine a situation where people are feeding off of each other's negative emotions. And that might explain sort of the, the, the part in which we see an acceleration of sentiment. However, then uh, that being said, that still does not quite explain why at, at the point in time where people are actually expressing a negative emotion, their tweets were more negative before, and after, right, coinciding with that peak, and that we have a very sharp return to the baseline levels whenever people express their baselines. But I agree with you that it's quite possible that there might be sort of a social amplification process taking place there. And it's definitely worthy of research. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. A, a quick question, Johan. Yeah. 
Is there some some sort of affect label for the group? Because all you show for is for the individual. But can we capture like the literature uh, says that you can capture some sort of affect label for a community, for a city, for a country, something like that? Or could we use Twitter to see if we can detect some such transition? Like now we can see that after one year of lockdown people are transitioning or something or when they realize that COVID is really a thing or stop denying the problem, I don't know, something that you can move from the individual level to a group level? Yeah, it's funny. I have a paper under review with a major journal and that is exactly about that actually, yes. I mean, it's the we've done this at the within subject level for a group of Twitter users, but there's, there's strong indications that society and even collections of individuals can actually un undergo um, sort of transitions of their mood state where, the, you know, where, you know, because with these kind of feedback loops, it's perfectly possible that, that societies maintain collectively some kind of emotional equilibrium. But when they're pushed around by external drivers, such as disasters or pandemics, right, that their resilience might be lowered. And at some point, because of that lowered resilience, you might have a critical transition from one equilibrium to another more pathological equilibrium which is of course very dangerous so part of my lab is actually very strongly looking at sort of the the social dynamics of uh, these uh, 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 of these um, effective processes and how they how societies can you can actually measure the resilience uh, of societies or groups of individuals in withstanding external external shocks that is a very active research area in my lab right now I don't have the time to talk about it, uh, but yeah, absolutely. And there, there's, there, there's one, Krishna uh, Bathina, one of my um, uh, students is actually, we're finishing the paper up right now, looking at sort of the effects of hurricanes on different communities. And you can see that some communities actually bounce back faster than others do, because for some reasons, collectively, they have greater emotional um, resilience towards those shocks. So yeah, it's a really interesting research area, I agree. And, and that, by the way, that research is done using social media data, because how else are you going to get, I mean, if, for example, if a city is hit by a hurricane, how else are you going to get a sample that, that includes 90% of the individuals in that city? Sure, you could do surveys, but, you know, got good. Okay, so I have only a minute left, really, to discuss the, <laughs> to do the rest of the talk. So how am I going to do this? I mean, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of measuring pathological pathologies of mood, mood disorders, like depression, anxiety, et cetera, that has become a major focus area in my lab. And so let me quickly give a very quick overview of this research and then I'll, I'll stop and leave, leave the floor for comments or questions. Um, you, you might've noticed there's been a lot of talk now with the lockdowns, et cetera, but people becoming more depressed because they're locked into their homes, right? But e even, be, you know, even beyond pandemics, depression, anxiety, mood disorders, and or internalizing disorders are a major uh, a, a problem in, in society. If you look at the prevalence and morbidity of, of uh, uh, depression alone in any population, you can see that in certain age groups, almost 12% of individuals, right, have 12% uh, uh, of it within the past year, within the past six months, has actually actively suffered from clinical depression. So whenever you're in a company, there's, there's 100 people, about 10 of them at that point in time might be suffering from depression. And that's not because of the diagnostic criteria being changed to make things more easy. We, we, we are really experiencing a, a sort of a, a, another pandemic, even before the actual pandemic of uh, depression and anxiety, especially among younger people, there seems to have been a, a major increase. Now, you might think, oh, well, it's not so bad to be a little sad, right? But depression is a serious disorder. Um, the WHO estimates that it's the leading contributor to the burden of disability worldwide. I mean, if you look at the loss of life, loss of productivity, it is tremendous. It is actually one of the most major public health uh, uh, challenges in, in most of our societies uh, right now. The problem is one, how to detect it and to better understand its dynamics. Uh, in my lab, we have actually been working quite a bit with looking at sort of the framework of critical transitions in complex systems to model um, uh, the sort of the dynamics of people developing internalizing disorders. Now, with critical transitions, you know, and, 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 and 
uh, with complex systems, what you very often see is that these systems maintain an equilibrium for quite a while, but as their resilience start is decreased, you see that they can switch from sort of more pathological um, to more pathological equilibria very quickly. That can happen repeatedly, but in lots of uh, uh, natural systems are significant hysteresis. Working with the group in Wageningen, actually, you saw those collaborators on the, the animation uh, that have developed models of critical transitions for ecological systems. For example, you've got a lake, lake is healthy, there's fish, there's, there's, uh, 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 there's frogs, there's plants, a little bit of algae, just a perfect balance. You add fertilizer, to the lake and you know a little bit doesn't do uh, much damage we had more and more fertilizer at some point the resilience of that system is damaged and it can drop in a pathological state very quickly without without with very little warning where suddenly the whole everything dies in the lake and once that happens you've got significant hysteresis to push that system back to its previous state because you essentially have to reseed the entire lake with life now Something like that might also be occurring in the dynamics of how people uh, develop depression. Um, there's been some indications that if you look at depression, there's a bimodality of symptoms and diagnostic criteria over time, meaning that people are either in sort of a healthy, well, a healthy state or in a depressed state where the transitions between those two states can be very rapid. Now, um, the I'm not going to go into sort of this, but I, I, I just wanted to show you this because the Ingrid von der Limpton, one of my colleagues at Wagner in PNAS actually published this, this paper, Critical Slowing Down as Early Warning for the Onset and Termination of Depression, where they actually showed that before people drop into the, a depressed state from the time series of their emotional states, you very often see sort of the time, the, the parameters of those time series change. We have higher autocorrelation and greater variance of that time series. That system starts to sway back and forth more significantly because it's lost resilience to withstand sort of random uh, external drivers, and at some point actually drops into a depressed state for, you know, sometimes um, uh, uh, unknown reasons. Anyway, I don't want to get into this, but we've been doing quite a bit of work uh, in uh, mental health by uh, relying on social media data. And again, I won't take too much of your time, just want to give you sort of a very broad uh, overview of how we did this. Instead of looking at at people saying, I feel bad or I feel unhappy. We looked at the literal expression of someone saying, is, I was or have been diagnosed with depression. Literally said that. You might think that, oh, not a lot of people do that. Well, a lot of people do. They come back from the doctor and they look for social support on, on, on social media and um, they will literally report that their doctor diagnosed them with depression. So once that happens though, here's an example of that. So today I got diagnosed with severe depression, and severe anxiety, but I got medicine for it, right? So someone posts that tweet, then we can harvest the tweets that were posted before and after the time of diagnosis. Those tweets, a sentiment analysis of those tweets, but also looking at sort of the general sort of lexical properties of those tweets, their density and time, um, their, their sentiment, et cetera. We can then derive the time series that Van der Leem put, used before to measure these transitions to depressed state and potentially even predict when someone would develop depression in advance of the actual diagnosis from the parameters of the time series um, of uh, mood and a variety of other lexical features that people um, uh, exhibit on uh, social media. All right, so we've done some basic tests. For, you know, for right now, we've got about 1,200 uh, uh, subjects. Thousands of people actually stated on Twitter that they uh, were diagnosed with depression. This analysis, which is for 130 subjects, we're, we've actually replicated this several times over now. Now, when, when, you get, when you have those tweets, you can do basic machine learning approaches. Use the, C, uh, the CMU Twitter part of speech tagger uh, and um, extract it, but... 20 different part of speech tags and 134,000 tokens, terms, right, with their part of speech tags, and then use those as features for a classification task. Um, I mean, we threw everything in the kitchen sink uh, on this, including we use the, the glove uh, word embedding vectors as uh, features for the terms that we extracted from these. And essentially, we found very good performance uh, with the 100 dimensional glove uh, embedding vectors to which we applied a principal component analysis to, to only keep 99% of the variance and throw away about 11% of the, the noise. And um, using a, a support vector machine with a linear kernel provided excellent accuracy. Honestly, the accuracy is so high that we think there's some bad overfitting happening. But as you can see, it's 
we can it, it's possible from someone's Twitter timelines and using the inclusion criteria of whether they reported a clinical, they were not self-reporting a diagnosis. They're, they're reporting a clinical diagnosis. And it's possible to separate these people with very high accuracy from people who were not diagnosed with depression. Um, now, uh, you know, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty too much, but here's a, 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 there's reasons to believe that we're not overfitting too much. Um, it is true that for the depressed, anxiety, suicide, and a bunch of other terms uh, were much more prevalent in their timelines than in those for non-depressed. But there's good reasons to believe that apart from sort of literally mentioning anxiety um, or suicide, there's, there's good indications that these results may generalize to uh, a, a vocabulary that is not solely related to um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the inclusion criteria of the test itself. Now, again, I have to say a word of caution with these results, and this is something that we're quite worried about. You have the, the and this is something that the Chiru uh, et al. in 2019 actually uh, pointed to as well. These classifiers are very deceiving in the sense that you've got, well, first of all, it, it starts with the sample. You've got your entire population, you got the, popul the, the subset of the population that is act actually on Twitter. You know, then we looked at people who, die, who reported having received a diagnosis of depression on Twitter, but of course there's lots of people who received the diagnosis in the population that aren't on Twitter. It's the blue square that you see here, right? Of those, we look at the subset that actually reported that they were diagnosed, right? And so the gender ratios are off here as well. And you may very, very well with this kind of data end up with using very refined deep learning models and classifiers to separate people into different classes between depressed and not depressed, but you might end up with uh, uh, tools that confuse chest x-rays with cats. I don't know whether you've seen this, this paper, but it shows that these algorithms are very easy to fool. And it is, of course, because of the inclusion criteria of the data that these, these, these uh, systems have been, um, uh, have been trained against. So we've been very weary of using, uh, sort of, of relying solely on machine learning for, without any sort of uh, theoretical uh, model driving uh, the task, right? And relying on these black, uh, on these machine learning algorithms like black boxes to perform a classification task. Because I, even though for, from, from intuitively, that's very interesting because now you can diagnose people online. That does not tell you anything about why people are depressed, what the dynamics of developing depression are, and most importantly, how we can actually intervene potentially on social media to make people feel better about life and themselves. Um, so I won't go into this. By the way, these transitions are quite visible in mood data. This is, for example, this is a graph that we made for one individual. This is their individual timeline that suffered from bipolar disorder. And you can clearly see very sharp transitions from sort of a manic to a depressed state in the timeline of this individual. And I think it's, it's instead of just trying to do classification tasks, it's much more important to use a theory-driven perspective of the dynamics of the processes that lead to the development of, of depression as a disorder um, uh, to characterize sort of these timelines, uh, because that will, might help us to actually um, not just improve our diagnostics, but um, also to improve the way that we, um, that we intervene and potentially also treat uh, these disorders. It's 1056. I think I've gone way over time. I also wanted to talk about our research where we actually use cognitive behavior, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, features to look at people's Twitter timeline and found that when you look at the structure of people's language, I'm skipping through this very quickly, uh, people that are depressed over express a particular type of language, not topics, not emotions, but the structure of their language and the structure of their thinking is different. And according to cognitive behavioral therapy, this, is, uh, this lies at the, the core of why some people develop, become depressed and some people um, do not become depressed. It's because there's changes in how people think about themselves and the, wor uh, and the world that are maladaptive and overly negative and it affect their emotions and their, and, and their behavior to, uh, uh, to the degree that they develop depression. Anyway, so don't wanna get a, go into these results too much. I wanna just open the floor and allow you guys to ask some questions and you have to come back again through slides now. To finish this presentation, you have to come back again another day and present these other results. Yeah, I'm sorry guys. I mean, I, 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 I overdid this.
But then again, I mean, you did ask questions, and you know, so I I went a little long at this one. Questions? Apologies. We still have time. Go ahead, Massimo. So, yeah, so. Hanan, so can I ask a question then? Of course. So my question now is, uh, I guess, is the the opposite of what I ask about Twitter, right? So how generalizable is this for medium where people are able to actually write a lot more? Because then you may get into topic modeling and, and people may talk about three, four, five different things there. And how would you actually single out the depression issue or the change of mood um, yes. in, in other mediums, right? So have you thought about that? Yes, absolutely. And I think this is your question is really at the crux of our approach here. So, yes, what you say is absolutely true. If we did, let's, if, if we use machine learning, topic modeling, etc., the what you are essentially analyzing is language, like the topics that people discuss. If people are depressed and that receive the diagnosis of depression very often talk about depression, right? So your topic model, your, your, your topic model will pick up on that and will overfit. Same thing with uh, classifiers, right? Whether they be just a uh, run-of-mill uh, naive Bayesian classifiers and very sophisticated uh, uh, deep learning approaches, what you will pick up mostly is sort of the topics that people discuss. What we're interested in is sort of the underlying dynamics of the, the pat pattern of thinking, like cognitive distortions. Recently published a paper in Ancient Human Behavior where we'll, we're looking at sort of distorted thinking, not the topics that people discuss. I think a lot of this research, yes, we have the classifiers, Yes, we have those tools, but they're essentially black boxes, and they're very prone to pick up on just topics that people talk about, about the weather, about sports, uh, about their diagnosis. There's the symptoms that they've been told by their doctor they might experience, right? The drugs that they might be taking, etc. And even though that's very interesting, and that allows us to diagnose, or I wouldn't call diagnose people, it, 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 it's very useful for classification tasks. It doesn't tell us much about the, dynam the dynamics of the processes that are involved in people developing these disorders. So in our research, we're, we're not so much focused on what people talk about, and how they say it, we're interested in sort of the indications of the underlying uh, behavior and thinking patterns that are associated with those disorders. I know that's a lot of words. Yeah, it says, if I'm not mistaken, he meant depression can change how people think and structure their language, exactly. Actually, your, the, the question was above this one, like, is it yes. Yeah, I did know Zudenic, right? I, I, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Yes, that's right. If you look at, I don't know how many of you have, I'm mean, not asking, but in, in, you know, if you, you're talking to a group of about 10 or 12 people, someone in that group might will have suffered from depression or anxiety and will have undergone cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the gold standard, which has proven to be quite effective in treating depression. And one of the tenets of cognitive behavioral therapy is that there's a triad between behavior, uh, emotions, and thinking. And we're, we've looked at sort of one of those triads, namely the modes of thought, the patterns of thought that are involved with the development of depression. So the people that have a certain way of thinking are indeed more susceptible to depression. And people that are depressed very often also exhibit those patterns of thinking. So it's a causal chain it's a causal chain. It's a dynamical process where when people start to think about the world and themselves in such ways, it will affect their mood. It will affect their behavior. It will affect their motivation. And then within that triad, that cognitive behavioral uh, triad, the beha their behavior will change, their mood will change. And as a result of that, their thinking will change as well. And so the so there's, there's a crucial feedback loop between these patterns of thought, which, which are, which are generally labeled distorted thinking or cognitive distortions and the development of depression. So both, both of these are true. Uh, well, what we showed is that that's th this paper here the, the, that we just published uh, right there. This paper, depressed individuals express more distorted thinking on social media. It showed that people that were diagnosed with depression on social, we, that on social media, we find that their language has changed in a way that would indicate that they're thinking that they, they are actually um, exhibiting that type of thinking. Exactly. So both are true. That type of thinking, cognitive distortions are involved in the development of depression. And we've shown that people who are actively depressed uh, exhibit different 
patterns of thought as manifested in the language and social media. Does that answer your, your question? Never goes up again, could be using it. Yes, yes, exactly, Anna. And that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at these transitions. That would be a critical transition. You'd see a lot of hysteresis and then people won't get back. So it would be super interesting to do that same analysis, but for timelines of people that were diagnosed with depression and timelines for people uh, like a random sample. Exactly. In fact, if you look at this paper here, depression alters the circadian pattern of online activity. That's more or less what we did. We looked at the circadian, that's not mood, but we also looked at the circadian mood patterns for people who were depressed and people who are not depressed, and we found significant differences. Meaning that, yes, you might be able to pinpoint the point in time and even the intestines of that critical transition in the timelines of people that, de that, that develop depression. We, we are already over time, but the good thing of doing this thing online is nobody's knocking the door saying, come on, your time is over. Yeah, so I'm, not being, I'm not being yeah. dragged off stage. Yeah. <laughs> so we still maybe have time for one more question. And please, guys, let's let's enjoy the opportunity of being everybody in the same room and do your question live. Otherwise, I'll just do on, on YouTube and you type. Go ahead, Maximum. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you so much. It was a very nice, very nice, inspiring talk. Um, I'm working on um, semantic framing on suicide notes. And oh, yes. one of the things that really, really struck me and my colleagues was that uh, uh, these suicide notes are actually quite nice. They're quite uh, joyous. They're filled with trustful language, which is quite unexpected from people that are committing suicide, that are going to commit suicide. So mm -hmm. what's like the, is there any any way of controlling the target of this language? Because it might be that it's not only the source, that the cognitive, the mental lexicon, let's say, or like the memory that people have that changed, or that changes, but also like the, according to the target, if I produce language targeting my beloved ones, maybe I will use like more positive or joyful or trustful language, whereas whether I'm talking to myself, let's say, I might end up using more angry or if I have depression, especially more like inhibitive or sort of this language. Is there any way that social media can help in addressing this targeting issue with language production? Yeah, exactly. I'm, you know, I'm happy to ask that question because context matters a lot, right? I mean, with these suicide notes, I mean, people are thinking of a particular audience for that note, right? And they will change their language accordingly. Now, on Twitter and social media, of course, that's also a context. People are talking to their friends. They're talking to everyone, right? They're, they're publishing these tweets, and therefore, their behavior, their language will, be, will adjust to that. So that's also why I think social media is such a powerful tool to use because it allows you to have sort of unforced, naturally occurring language when people are in a social setting, they're not, they're not talking to their family, they're not talking to their friends, they talk to everybody in general. Now that has its own biases, undeniably, because people do front a little bit, right? they, they, they pose. So that's undeniable. But I will say this though, the, what we showed in that, that paper that we just published in Nature Human Behavior, we accounted for mood, for uh, uh, the emotional valence of the language. We, you know, we split it, we did stratified sampling, looked at male, female, et cetera. Uh, we looked at activity levels. And what we found is that it's the, it's the pattern of thinking revealed by the language. So even when the language is joyous, right? It's these cognitive distortions that seem to be associated with depression. Now, is suicide is something different from depression. Uh, you know, it's, uh, that's a different setting. But what, what really struck me is it's the pattern, it's the mode of thinking not the emotion, not what's positive or negative, but it's the pattern of thinking. So it's something like, give you an example of a typical cognitive distortion would be something like, I'm not gonna go to the party because I'm sure I will have a bad time since my, all, all of my friends hate me all the time. So, you know, so th th of course that's a very negative statement, but it could also be like, my friends are always sending me messages and it's, you know, that is that is positive sentiment. My friends are always calling me, you know, it's positive sentiment, but it's still dichotomous thinking. It's still dichotomous reasoning and it is a cognitive distortion. And so it's it's it, so that's what we're trying to aim at here. But I mean, it's a very long answer to your question, but I completely agree with what you said. And I think that's why it's important to rely on multiple data sources, not just social media and perhaps also not suicide notes. But yeah, it's, it's good to triangulate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Last, last question, because we then we need to go. So George. So that's Vladimir is asking whether social media analysis will be preferred option of behavioral analysis in the future. 
I mean, I think it already is to a degree. I mean, at least for us, it is because I mean, I'm working with psychologists and they're used to putting like, you know, relying on results that they obtained for like 10 people that they invited to the lab, right? <clears throat> and here we have 70% of the US population on a daily basis, keeping a log, uh, uh, you know, keeping a, a very detailed record of everything they feel, everything they do. People are, oh, I just went for a great run. Well, that's interesting. Now, you know, they've been running, they've been physically active, which has an effect on their mood, may or not have an effect on their mood. So I wouldn't say it overrides traditional methods. Right now, we're also doing surveys, by the way, but we're doing surveys where we're asking people for their Twitter handles. And so that way we can triangulate and I think you get much greater accuracy by doing the surveys because that also allows you to adjust your sample and make sure it's representative. So you don't end up with a sample of 90% computer nerds that are on Reddit, right? Talking about, um, you know, I don't know, soccer right? or their favorite team. So. Yeah, we, we think I think these both both of these approaches are very important. You have the computational methods being applied to large scale, big data obtained from social media, and then you have sort of the the traditional social science methods, you know, the surveys, the lab methods that we need. I'm not saying that we don't need that anymore because we need that to make sure our samples are good, our samples are representative, and we know for for which group of individuals we're drawing conclusions, right? And so I think that triangulation will see a lot of that in the future no doubt, where you have computational scientists working with social science like we do in the lab, and we triangulate from these different data sources to arrive at, I wouldn't, uh, see when, just one last comment here. What I've been worried uh, uh, about, and it's funny how when we submit grant proposals or we submit papers, there's always like a machine learning expert on the review panel, and they come back and say, oh, but the method that you use this is 0.03% less accurate than the super deep learning Burt you know, so and so with transformers and, you know, and yes, yes, that could very well be, but we're not interested in computer, uh, computing for computing sake. We're interested in studying how people develop depression, how, uh, because when we understand the mechanics of when they do, then we can also perhaps make contributions to public health. And so that's why I think it's really important to have that inter interdisciplinary collaboration between computer scientists, informaticians, and social scientists, because I think that th that's where the big advances will be. Anyway, so that's my rant for today. Thank you so much, Johan, for your lovely talk as usual. And probably you'll come back to finish because I, I know that you have a lot of new material to, to show us. Guys, if you invite me to Exeter and you feed me enough beer, I will tell you about my rat my plans to radically revamp how science is okay. funded. Okay. I guarantee we it. You can have a deal and you DJ. We, we provide beer, I'll bring my and decks, you, you sure. provide the music, and then we do a party. Okay, sounds good. As soon as COVID is <laughs> over. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> See you, man. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all. Thank Stay you, everyone. Healthy and sane. Bye-bye.